Uh, my name is Stanford Gibson. I'm the sediment transport specialist at HEC. And the stuff I'm going to be presenting today, everything you see is has been coded by Zach Morris, who is uh, one of the new hires here at HEC, developer who's done a lot of this work um, and uh, has kind of made this vision reality. And the vision is that when I was a young river scientist and sediment engineer, I would download these data clouds from the USGS. And then it's hard to think of something more fundamental to river mechanics and river science than the flow load or flow concentration curve that we get that defines our sediment flux into our system. We use this for, set, for, for model boundary conditions all the time. You can't develop a sediment budget without these kind of data. And so we're using these all the time. But if you are familiar with these data, you, you'll go to the USGS and you'll download these. And it's, we, like, we call it a data cloud for a reason, because it's, it's hard to make sense of them. There's usually an order of magnitude of, of scatter. And as a, I, rem I remember as a young new en engineer in the core, I just thought, what on earth should I do with these things? And so you know, the, everyone's first impulse is to go to Excel, download it, right click, and fit a power function through it and be done. And that's, um, that's fine, that's a good start, but there are actually a number of things that are wrong with that. There are a number of things that you need to do to analyze these data before you use them for a model or a boundary condition. Things that no one ever, I thought about naming this talk, the five things no one ever told me about sediment rating curve data. But what I propose to, to MRGMP is to develop a tool that would actually walk new engineers through the best practices. So no one actually has to tell them about this because the tool will walk them through these best practices, essentially the things I've learned in the last 20 years that I should have been doing all along. And that will also make maybe not new engineers like myself and some of the folks I see on this line, it'll just kind of make this all of these analyses easier, more visual, and just make everything better. So these are the seven common issues that I've seen that people encounter with sediment rating curves, things that we need to do compensatory analysis for. You, it's just, you just can't just right click and put a power function through your data. You actually have to do some other analysis, some other statistics. For some of these, we developed new statistics that are going to help. For some of these, we just applied the, the best practice industry standard. And so I'm going to walk through these. We're going to move pretty quickly. And uh, these are all things that now the tool does. We developed a tool called the rating curve analysis tool. Right now, it's a standalone tool. It's going to it's going to live in RAS as well. What I'll do is I'll, I'll introduce the common issue, I'll explain the best practice, and then I'll demo how to deal with it in the tool. Okay, so let's do this. First, the first one I, I put this in just because dealing with the USGS data format is can be a nightmare. Um, the only ways to deal with the best practice is very careful Excel work, or now they've written an R importer, which is what I tend to do. But um, I have seen some very masterful Excel spreadsheets for how to deal with these data. As, as sediment transport data are water quality data, and so they come up in in this big water quality mess. You can refine your water, your search a little bit with the USGS data. Incidentally, this is the worst slide ever um, because it's uh, by counterexample. But the idea is that these data come in. The flow can be daily or, or instantaneous or a mix and match of both. The sediment can come in as concentration and load. And there are like eight different ways that the USGS can specify gradation. And it can be sieve or hydrometer, and those can overlap, and then what you do. And so a lot of people have written protocol to deal with this, but just getting these data into Excel without making major errors is kind of the first problem. And so the first thing we did is we just wrote an import. If you download the water quality data for any gauge, and you don't have to be precious about it, you don't have to put in the, 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 the numbers you want, you can just download the whole giant QW file, we will import that and put it in the format that you want. And so, for example, this data set, there are 3,227 instantaneous flows and 121 daily flows. Yeah, use them both. In this case, there are 2,000 loads and almost 4,000 concentrations, and they don't necessarily overlap. And so you make the choice, hey, use the load, but if there's no load and concentration, convert it to a load for me, or vice versa. And then uh, if there's both sediment and sieve diameter and fall diameter, you can choose which one takes priority. because it's pretty unhelpful when you import data and there are two diameter, two um, percentages for a given diameter and uh, they're not the same. And so you, have, you make that decision. And so we'll import for you. Let me actually just introduce you to the tool. This is the sediment data analysis tool. This is what it looks like right now. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the RIPRAP calculator, uh, we went through and gave it a brand new look and feel. So it has a, the RAS 7.0 look and feel. By the time this comes out in RAS 6.2, it will have that 
that, that complete redo the new look and feel. So this will show you the functionality, but not necessarily the look and feel. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to File, Import, USGS style tab delimited because that's how I store my CSV files. Eventually what we want to do is just go to the site and get it. I have an intern working on that right now. But for now, if you just download it from the, the website, you can go get those data. Um, I'm going to bring in the Omaha data. These are data from the Missouri River on the Omaha, at the Omaha gauge. And there they are. We have 2,107 values. We got them here in flow load. You can switch between concentration and load if you want. I find that there are generally are concentration people and load people. I'm a load person because I just think about things in terms of flux, but a lot of people would just rather think about concentration. And so that'll convert back and forth. And then we give you these little, uh, these little tool tips down here that will tell you if we did something to your data as they come in. We can, you can also go in and overwrite these data, but as with everything in the HD edit, Hydraulic Design Editor and RAS, if you overwrite something to look at the sensitivity, we're going to leave that red so we know that there has been tampering and, uh, and you can go back and fix it later. All right, so that one's, that one's a, a little bit trivial, but it's actually not because it's a lot of work to get these data into the format we want them in. But now let's actually do the real work. So the second one, and I'll, I'll warn you, this one's a slog. We're gonna look at we're gonna look at some log transform statistics. If if I lose you on this one, don't turn off the webinar. Come on back because uh, because the other ones are more science based. Here's the problem: if you go to Excel and you right click on the data and you fit a power function through that, that relationship, that model of those data are going to be biased right out of the box. There is a fundamental intrinsic bias to the log transform that Excel or any most programs use to fit a power function to your data. And so the first thing you have to do with these data is unbias your relationship. And so this is how this works. You know, in most cases, we model our data cloud as a power function where load is some very small coefficient times flow to a power. And that power is generally around two, You're between 1.5 and 2.5. Two is not a bad first guess. And so we're going to try to fit th this power function to our data. Let's just review a little bit about how we fit functions to data. And let's just look at a linear regression. How do you, how do you get a best fit for a linear regression? Well, what you do is you measure what we call the residual. That's the difference between the model and the observation for each of the observations. And then you choose the parameters, the slope and the intercept that minimize the square of the sum of those residuals. And so you can move around, actually you do calculus, but you basically get the line so that the total distance of these red lines, but also squared, is the least. That's how you fit, that's how you fit a function. Okay, there's something magical about a power function is that you know this is a power function and I, I made I made this one up and sampled it randomly with some some scatter. We have load is a small coefficient times flow to the 2.5 and this is what like a sediment rating curve would look like. This is not how we look at it though. We tend to look at these in log log space because power functions tend to be linear in log log space and that's really convenient. You know power functions are magical this way because if you take the log of both sides it becomes linear. This is what we call a log transform linear regression. And so this is how that works. You, know, you take the log of the, of the load, you take the log of this, and you get the log of the coefficient, A, which becomes its own coefficient, which is an intercept. The power comes down and becomes the slope. And so the power is the slope of the line times the log of the flow. And so now you can actually do just linear regression in log space to fit this curve. And that's what Excel is doing behind the line. It's a, it's a log transform regression, and that is super neat. That's really cool, but there's a problem. The problem is that when you come back out of log space, you have, you have a fundamental bias in that analysis. This is how that works. And this is, this is as deep as it's gonna get. So follow me through this slide and then we'll take care of it in the tool. And so if you think about this regression in log space, you have a log of flow of three and then you have two residuals. You have a residual load, the log of the load here is 0.7, high, and then the residual here, the log of this load is 0.7 low. And so in a root mean squared error regression, those would offset. Those would be equal and opposite errors, and they would kind of wipe each other out. But when you come out of log, when you delog the data, when you detransform the data, the high residual is going to be larger than the low residual, which means that 
you're in the actual world and not the fake log world, your regression is actually going to be fundamentally low. And so all power functions are fundamentally low. Oh, they have, they, they're biased low. And so what do we do about that? Well, there are a couple of mathematical tools we can use. There's nothing elegant. In fact, the most popular one, the one the USGS uses to fit, to unbias their data is what they call the Dewan smearing estimate. That's actually the name of the paper. It's the smearing estimate. That's how like precise and like elegant this math is. But the idea here is they just go look at all the residuals and they back out the difference and they, they, they compute the bias by just backing it out from the residuals. And so this is the NAMU um, suspended sediment curve in, uh, from some work we did in Lao. And you can see that the blue line is the biased regression that we got out of Excel. And then we ran the Dwan correction and we found, the, the, we found that there was about a 32% bias. And so what the new equation comes out to be is your sediment load is the coefficient times the flow raised to the power with this Dwan coefficient there. And so if it's 32% high, this coefficient comes out to be 1.32. It increases your result. Okay, so back to the tool. So here is our data analysis tool. And what you'll see here is we have our bias correction factors. And we have two of them. We have Dwan, which is what the USGS uses, and we have Ferguson, which is what the core uses. And by the core, I mean Ron Copeland, because Ron Copeland was kind of the first and maybe only one to do this in the core for many years. And so, and Ron used Ferguson. I talked to Ron about this recently. He's actually moved away from this in linear regression and likes to do nonlinear regression of concentration, which is another option, which is something that we also add. But we, what you'll notice is that you know, Duan, the Duan correction factor is 1.178, which means that basically it's saying, hey, we need to increase your loads by 17.8% in order to unbias them, not because of anything scientific, just because of the way the regression works. Or Ferguson, if you check, click on that, it's 1.21. Now, did you do anything as the user? No, you didn't. This is automatic. You can go in and turn on the biased regression, that's now this gray line, but we're not even gonna show you that by default. By default, we are going to give you the unbiased regression. We're just gonna do that out of the box. Um, you're not even gonna see it happen, but, but we will show you what the coefficients are. Okay, so the first thing we're, the tool does, and maybe the most important thing, because this math isn't hard, but it's tedious. And so we all have spreadsheets that do this, or those of us who have spreadsheets that do this, they can have bugs, they can have errors. And so to kind of have a standardized tool that does this calculation for you so that, you know, if you're a 25 year old engineer, you don't have to develop your own spreadsheet or learn someone else's, but they can actually go through this. There's, there's just huge value in this. There, a little story about the correction factor. I obviously, I did not know about this for the first like 10 years of my career. I was just doing power functions through rating curves. And then I learned about this and I thought, uh-oh, I've done a lot of sediment transport studies. And so I went back and looked at one of my first sediment transport studies. And in order to get that study, that model to calibrate, I had increased the flow load curve by 20%. And so I went in and I computed the Duan correction factor, 20%. If I had just done it right, out of the, the model would have calibrated out of the box. I wouldn't have had to add any swag. All right, so all right, away from the statistics towards the science. The second thing that we, we absolutely have to account for in these rating curves is non-stationary. You know, most of you have seen some of these classic dam curves where you know, you've got sediment load before and after the dam, but there's also other things going on. You need to make sure that a lot of times we just plot the flows and loads irrespective to time. We just make a data cloud and we regress it without thinking, hold on, you know, if I'm building a historic model and trying to calibrate, then maybe I should not be using the most recent data. Or if I'm trying to project into the future, maybe I shouldn't be using the oldest data to develop my rating curve. And so uh, Warwick 2015, I think is one of the best recent treatments of this. Warwick looked at a number of rating curves that weren't actually rating curves, but a series of temporal rating curves that shifted over time. This, this is good work. This is a, a rating curve that Calvin Creech and I did on the Madeira River in Brazil. And uh, these are the like six years of flow load data after the dam went in on, on the Madeira in, the, in Brazil. And what you can see is that there's just a steady rotation. Just in the six, I mean, work is looking at decades, but just in the six years after this dam went in, the flow load curve rotated down. And so if I'm gonna predict 
the future of the Madeira, which I was doing, I can't use these historic data. I have to use the data that, the, the data that re reflect the future. But if I'm trying to reproduce the past, I can't use the current data. And so what the tool do, does is it provides some kind of robust tools to help you visualize and quantify the stationarity. Okay, so back to the tool. So I'm going back to my Omaha data. And uh, the stationarity analysis is here. And so we're going to do a lot more work on this. Uh, we're coming to the end of the first year of a two-year study. So in the first year, we produced what we call a minimum viable product. That's software speak for uh, you got to get something that's ready to use so users can use it and give it give you feedback. So we've, we've done that. We've got a minimum viable product is what we're showing. In the next year, we've got a couple other statistical analyses we want to add, and we're going to you know roll it out with users' manuals and things like that. And so what we have here is, a, is just a, a, a time bar. And you can run the time bar back and forth and visualize the stationarity of the data. And so what you can see here is that if we just kind of choose something in the late 80s, early 90s, the purple data is the data after it. The yellow data are the data before it. And you can see that there is a, a strong non-stationarity in, in these data. Essentially, the earlier data has a steeper curve, much higher loads than the later data. And you know, anytime you go from higher loads to lower loads, you suspect dams. But these data only start in 1971. The, the dam, this is, a, this is a, significantly after the Missouri River dams. And I didn't know this. And so I reached out to the, to the Missouri folks and we had a pretty interesting conversation about why is there such strong stationarity, you know, decades after the dams. And so you know, what you can do now is we will we output these rating curves independently. And so you can go and say, hey, I want the historic rating curve, this yellow line, which is, you know, all of them are bias corrected. You can go get the biased rating curves if you want, but you have to kind of dig for it because we don't really want you to have them. And so this is the bias corrected historic rating curve. You can go get that if, say, you're doing a model and trying to calibrate in the, you know, eight, in the 70s and 80s. But if you're trying to project into the future, well, then you probably want to use the current data and the current rating curve. And so you can go get this purple rating curve and use that for your future projections. Now, the idea here is that users will be able to visualize the result and kind of, it's pretty qualitative. And so what we're generating is a metric. And what we, what we want to do is plot time versus some metric of load. So you can look at how this metric of load, which is standardized, it, does, it wouldn't be dependent on the flow seen in that year, changes over time so that you can kind of pick an inflection point of when when there's an actual switch in the uh, in the the load regime of the of the system okay the fourth common rating curve issue is that so far we've just put a single power function through our data cloud uh, that's not actually very common these rating curves are often bent inflected they're, they're often you can't model them with a single line. And so this is a very famous rating curve here. This is, uh, this is from Schmidt and Graham's on the Colorado River. And so you'll see right here, we, um, they fit a rating curve to everything lower than 20,000 CFS. And it's a, it, it's a credible rating curve. It makes a lot of sense. It's pretty steep, actually, power 3.8. But over 20,000 CFS, things fall off precipitously because it's a supply-limited system. And so if you used this rating curve to model the upper part of the curve, you would vastly overpredict. And if you tried to just put one rating curve through here, you would underpredict on the low flows and overpredict on the high flows. And so a lot of times we try to use a bent or inflected rating curve, but when we do that, we get away from statistics. We get away from things that are reproducible. We end up honestly drawing lines. And so one of the things we asked is, hey, can we do better than that? And so this really came up recently with John Shelley. John Shelley did at the Kansas City District did an excellent study where he looked at the rating curves across Kansas. And he was looking at reservoir sedimentation and uh, he saw that almost all of his um, rating curves across Kansas all had this inflection. And it turns out that the inflection was about the, it scaled. It was at about the same, not flow, but recurrence interval. Turns out it's bankful. That's a, it's an interesting story in its own right that I don't have time for. But the idea here is that you know John Shelley is one of the best sediment transport engineers we have in the core, and he said, "Well, how do you do this? How do you do this defensively and reproducibly?" I was reviewing the study, and I was like, oh, 
I would tell you to be more defensible and reproducible, but I don't know how to do this. And so he made really good assumptions and moved forward with the study. But we said, hey, there's got to be a more reproducible and defensible way to do this. And so I hired a statistical student as part of this project from UC Davis. He is a PhD student in the stats department. Now he's a professor. He just got hired. So we got we got lucky on our student hire, Andrew, Andrew Beldino. And he just developed, he just went into what's called not statistics. Um, and so this is piecewise linear regression um, with, with what they call a knot, which is an inflection point. And um, he wrote the math over here on the left. I asked him to draw me some pictures, which he did over here on the right, which are much more helpful. And uh, But here's the idea, is that in piecewise linear regression, essentially, if you specify a knot, which is an inflection location, you can solve a least mean squared minimized residual regression for the two lines that meet at that position. And so it doesn't kind of find the knot for you. And so you have to do that for specified points. So what we do in the calculator is we go through and we say, okay, each of the flow load data points is a candidate for the inflection point. And we go through and we do a piecewise linear regression of all of the data as if th that flow load point was the inflection point. And what we do then is we get an evaluation of error for each of those hypothesis inflections. And so what you have here on the X is the flow of every data point in this series. Now, this sounds, if this sounds like a brute force approach, it is. That's who I am. But the, uh, you know, doing this with 3,000 data points takes three seconds. So it's not a big deal. We go through and we look at each data point, and then we compute the residual for a piecewise linear regression based on an inflection point at that position. And what you'll see is there are kind of two minimum error solutions here. There's a global minimum error. At this low flow, if we put the inflection point there, we actually get the minimum error. Well, of course we do, because you can see the inflection point at the low end, and that's because, you know, do you trust concentration measurements less than, at flows less than 10 CFS? I don't. They, they're bananas. And so, you know, often there's a kind of false, or, or even if it's true, we don't care. We just don't care about concentrations down there if we're doing any sort of sediment budget. So often there's a true minimum at the low end that's not helpful to us. If we're going to do a piecewise linear regression of our data, we want it at the high end. And so here there's a second local minimum which actually matters. This is the one that actually matters. And so what we've done is we've allowed the user to define, you know, hey, do I want to look at all the data or do I want to look at just the top half of the data or do I want to look at a range? And so let's go back to our tool. And so we're back to the Omaha data. And what I'm going to say is I'm going to, I'm going to use all the data. And I'm just going to calculate, this is the piecewise linear regression piece. I'm just going to calculate a piecewise linear regression. And there it is. And we're showing the bias as well, which we won't when this is a real piece of software. And there you go. We have, we have the piecewise linear regression. It tells you where it calculated the inflection point. And it calculated the inflection point at about 60,000 CFS. Now, just visually, if you look at that, that's a, better, that's a better relationship for these data. But there's a couple of other things you can do. Um, in this case, it's done a nice job fitting the inflection point where we, it was. But if the inflection point was down here, we could come up here and say, hey, you know what? I want the upper. I want you to find it in the upper half of the data. We recalculate. Now it's going to be the same because it already was that. But if we wanted to say, "Hey, set it to the lower half," it's going to be close to the result. You can also say, "Hey, I want to set it at, uh, at in a specific range," and so we're going to look kind of between two ranges. Or you can go in and say, "Hey, you know what? I think that the inflection point is at eighty thousand CFS." Um, and so what we'll do is we'll go in and find the minimum error uh, model that gives you a piecewise linear relationship with that um, pre-specified uh, knot. Okay, but I'm going to go back to all data and recalculate and, uh, and get that result. Okay, the fifth thing that I think um, is problematic, it's really problematic until you realize it's a problem and then it's just tedious. Although it ends up being, th this actually ends up being much harder on the other side is that you need to distinguish like close proximity observations from replicates. A lot of times these data, you just get all of the measurements. And so the question is, 
are these independent observations that I can, that satisfy the regression independence uh, criteria, or are they replicates? Are they mismatched? And so the telltale sign that you're dealing with potential autocorrelation or replicates is you get these vertical striations in your data. I was uh, I was working on a study once, and this is the USGS data I got. And uh, I went and the USGS said, hey, you have 63 samples. And I was like, yes, I can develop a rating curve with 63 samples. Um, and then I saw this and I was like, oh, I might have seven because these are all collected on the same day. These are all collected on the same day. These samples were all collected over a three day period. Can I use those all as independent observations? That's an open question, but I definitely can't use these as independent observa observations. These are replicates. And so if you use your replicates as observations, then you're going to overweight the value of the observation on that day. And so you need to collapse your replicates without removing observations that are independent, but just close in time. This is particularly compelling on the Mississippi gauges. Now, there are many people on this call who are going to know why this is and be able to explain this a lot better than I am. But here's the St. Louis gauge. And you can see that uh, the 1950 59 to 1984 samples. These are single samples. These show up as single samples. But after uh, 2010, each day they collected at like 10 to 15 replicates. And so if you know a new engineer downloads these data and fits a power function through them, it's going to way overweight the modern samples because they're reported with replicates, where the, the other ones don't have that kind of power because they're single observations. And so, you know, the first thing that you have to do is determine um, replicates from is determine which replicates go together. Um, it can be a pretty tedious exercise, and so we have added that capability to the tool. And so, I'm going to actually leave Omaha now. Nothing against Omaha, surprising city, underrated city, and I'm going to go to St. Louis, another great city. And here are those St. Louis data we we're looking at. Now, if you look at the stationarity of the data, you can kind of see, now you can see the old data versus the new data. And you can see that the new data has the striations, the old doesn't. For those of you who are really familiar with the Mississippi gauges, you might be saying, well, duh, that's the way our data are. But you see this all over the place. And sometimes it's more egregious and sometimes it's a little bit more subtle. And so if we go here to serial correlation analysis, we can specify the time the time range of a cluster. And so the cluster is, you know, what range of time do we consider flow data replicates rather than independent observations? Here I've got it set at 12 hours. We can go to 24 as one day. We'll set it. And then this gives you some summary statistics. It says, hey, you have 105 independent clusters of flow within 24 hours. Um, that's 1,235 of your samples. 95% of your data are in these daily clusters. And so right now, by default, we're treating those as independent. But if we come here, we can say average clusters. Now what you see is that if you treat the, I've got the, the initial unbiased regression of all of the data that was overweighting the recent ones. But now if you go in and average the, uh, the replicates, now you get a much higher flow load relationship. Now, in this case, there's also a weird stationarity thing going on. You have to parse that out, preferably with a mentor engineer in, in a, one of these districts that knows this system. But hopefully by the time you've gotten through these analyses, you realize, hey, there's more going on here than I think. I need to think carefully about this. I can't just regress it and run. Oh, and then um, if you want, you can also go in and uh, and now what I'm doing is I'm showing the average data. We're not going to show that by default, but now you can go in and see all of the green point, light green points are the, the points that were averaged to get the red points. Incidentally, if you don't like any of these colors, all of these colors are totally changeable. This is a fully functioning interface. One of our goals is that uh, we want to generate publication quality plots. We don't want you to have to like steal these data, go put them in Grapher or R and uh, make your own plots. We want publication quality plots to be coming out of RAS. And so uh, we're going to be working on that. Um, that's one of the next things we're going to do to get into 6.2 is make sure that these plots are exactly the way you want them to be. Oh, before we go to the next one, there's something important to recognize here is that not all samples taken on the same day are replicates. 
And so here, um, this is the Rio de la Plata data. The Rio de la Plata is a, a really a mountainous, flashy river down in Puerto Rico. And, and what you see is that these samples up here, these were all taken on one day, 7th of October 2010. But they range from 7,000 CFS to 25,000 CFS. That is a significant portion of the sampled range. Are those replicates? No. Are they independent samples? I don't know. What did I do? I, I emailed Molly Wood from the USGS <laughs> because uh, you know, to what, how do you determine in a flashy system like that, you know, on the Mississippi, lumping everything from the same day together is fine, but maybe it's not. Maybe on the Mississippi, everything taken within three days of each other is a replicate. And on the Rio de la Plata, uh, two hours is, is the appropriate lumping parameter. So um, we're still working on this. One of the things that, you know, the USGS has a, incidentally, the statistical manual of the USGS is massive and really interesting if you're into that sort of thing. But they have a serial correlation detect algorithm. They actually have a tool called SED. And so what we did is we hired another graduate student from the statistics department. He just delivered his uh, deliverables yesterday. And what he did is he's reproduced this analysis in R, which is basically the way that we transfer. Um, now Zach is going to put it in the tool. And so we'll be able to do the, the official USGS um, serial correlation analysis in, in this tool, you know, maybe, maybe by the 6.2 release, maybe by the 6.3 release, um, but this is gonna come. The issue is, I'm not sure it's that useful. And so at, the more we learned about this, and the more we talked to the statisticians about it, the more we thought, oh, yeah, there might be a better way to do this. So um, we are still on the serial correlation warpath. We're trying to figure out a better way to do this, um, to give some automated feedback about when are they re replicates and when are they, uh, because with the, with the USGS method, you still have to kind of use your intuition about when they're replicates and when they're um, observations. Okay, we're getting close. Hysteresis. Everyone, I think most people know about hysteresis. This is again, the Madeira River. The, um, the Madeira River before the dams went in was the most natural river I've ever worked on. And it, so we got to see sediment transport behavior that is like sediment transport's behavior supposed to be. And so here is flows and concentrations on the Madeira. And you can see that there's this, this super strong clockwise hysteresis. Now, hysteresis, hysteresis is just a, a electricity and magnetism term, which means that the path you take is different than the path you return by. And so uh, sediment transport generally, not always, but generally is higher on the rising limb than on the falling limb because of supply limitation. You essentially run out of sediment, although there are many weird things that hysteresis can do on these systems. And so, uh, you know, this is from John Shelley's in my paper on the Missouri River, more hysteresis. And so hysteresis complicates your, I'm gonna go back to Omaha here. Hysteresis complicates your rating curve, because essentially a rating curve is a single line. And so here, what we do with hysteresis isn't so much quantitative. We, we're going to allow you to investigate hysteresis. Again, if you try to do this in Excel, it gets pretty, uh, it gets pretty unwieldy. And so, you know, what's the biggest event on the Missouri? Well, recently, it's like 2019, but we don't, let's look at the 2011 data. And so here is 2011 on the Missouri, and this is the big flood. And you know, I, I chose this one because I know that essentially the Missouri ran out of sediment in 2011. It just ran, that this was not just a large flow, it was a large long flow. And so the, the fine sediment dropped, it, you got coarsening on the bed. And so you can see, um, we give you the arrows, you can see the path up and the path down. And we don't have great data for some of the other years. Some of the other years don't show um, exactly what we want, but uh, you know, 2000, if you've got hysteresis, you'll find it. And so the hysteresis tool is just a visualization tool, but I think it's a really helpful way to think about what your system's doing. Then finally, to get to Andy's question, so everything we've talked about so far is just bulk load, concentration, but sediment is log distributed, which means that you know bulk load can include particles that are orders of magnitude smaller or larger than other particles, how that impacts your system, it's huge. And so in any model, you can't just specify the flow load curve. You also have to specify the gradations associated with that flow load curve, the gradational breakdown. And uh, if you're doing kind of a sound sediment budget, at least you're going to have to do a fine coarse split on those to kind of understand wash load versus bed material load. 
The problem is those data in the, the when you get those data in the USGS, they're very difficult to manage. I mean, if you've worked on it with them in Excel, it's easy to make mistakes. They're hard to find. It's hard to train people to do it. And then it's also pretty important. This is the paper that I've written that I'm most proud of that no one's heard of. One of the things that I've started asking people who write papers is what's the paper that you wrote that no one knows about but you wish they did because you think it's more important that it's getting attention for. And this is another statistician I worked with at UC Davis, um, Christine Kai, and uh, we looked at um, 78 gauges and looked at how gradation changes as a function of flow. And it turns out that rivers can fine or coarsen as a function of flow. And so over on the left, the Dolores River as flow increases, the, the load gets coarser. Over on the right, the Eel River, as flow increases, a uh, load gets finer. And so it, this is not trivial. It, it's, not, it's not even like directionally or monotonically trivial. And sometimes it's not monotonic, sometimes it rises and falls. It's not easy. And so we've added a, a, uh, a function to the tool where um, it automatically downloads these data. And so if I go back, I'm just going to re-import uh, Omaha. You can save these as sessions. Um, I'm just not doing it because I want you to kind of see the process. But if you go to flux gradation, so it turns out that uh, the Omaha data has a lot of gradational information. And so up here we have all of the flows ordered in size from lowest to highest. We have all of the loads. And then we have the percentages associated with each of the grain sizes. Uh, if any of you have ever gone and gotten these data from the USGS uh, uh, CSV files, the, you know that uh, oh, we just did a lot of work for you. So just the work alone and the mistakes that are made um, alone, it's useful. But uh, then we report the D50 and the D85 if it can be reported with the data provided. And then we will show it in a monochromatic uh, Curve. Now, this has too many for the monochromatic visualization to help that much. If there are only like 20 or 30, which is often the case, then you know, the, showing it from light to dark will, will really show you the, the, the transition. But the other thing we do is we plot the D85. So here's flow versus D85. You can do it in log or linear scale. And what you can see is that there actually is a, a, a legitimate coarsening at the Omaha gauge. You know, there's obviously a lot of noise in these low flows. And, and we'll add some visualization here. We'll add some binning to help you look at these as averages and bins. But you can definitely tell that the Omaha gauge is coarsening. Um, the samples we have for the high flows are substantially higher, even if you were to add error bars, than the, the low flows. We are cruising in towards the end here. So that's what we've done so far. RAS 6.1 just came out. The target for this is RAS 6.2, which we're targeting for December or um, January. The idea is that this is a tool that's going to live in RAS because a lot of these analyses live in RAS. But one of the one of the objectives is for us to take things like this and the and the riprap calculator and the other hydraulic design functions that live in RAS and start to package them together as their own tool that someone could use if, say, they're not familiar with RAS. And there's nothing RAS-specific in here. A lot, of, a lot of the other tools, they use output from RAS to do these analysis. This, we use these analysis to form inputs for RAS, but it's also really helpful just for doing a sediment budget or something like that. You know, so, like I said, Zach Morris did all of the uh, software development, and uh, on the, this, uh, he, he developed this interface. Our statistical interns are Andrew Baladino and Russell Okino. And then um, this was 100% funded by uh, this program, the Mississippi River Geomorphology and Potomology Program. It's been one of my favorite projects because I've had these questions for years and wanted to get to the bottom of them. But I also just feel like, just I'll wrap up with this. I feel like, you know, I'm getting to be one of the older members of the core now. And I've been thinking about how I want to become a grumpy old man. And I've decided I want to do it without getting grumpy. Um, I want to remember that when I was a new engineer, I didn't know any of this stuff and no one was around to tell me and I didn't know who to talk to. And so what I want to do is I want to build tools that will help guide our young engineers through these processes so they can learn it faster than I did. That's kind of one of my major goals. And I, I, I think it's really great that the, that the um, MRGNP program um, kind of caught that vision and is trying to pass on these best practices. Um, hopefully this tool will help.